Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session in our spring webinar series, Research for Funding and Publication. Today, we are going to cover what to expect in peer review. My name is Megan Kowalski, and I am the Outreach and Reference Librarian. I'll be handling the behind the scenes logistics for today's event, and my colleague, Catherine Meals, is going to be presenting. Next slide. So I want to welcome you all today. We are going to have time uh, at the end for Q&A, both recorded and unrecorded. The recording of this will be posted to our YouTube page probably by this afternoon and will be sent to all registrants. Uh, during this session, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will keep an eye on them and we'll either prompt Kathy to answer them in the moment or we will cover them at the end. So again, thank you for attending today and now take it away, Kathy. Great. Thank you, Megan. Hello, everybody. Um, so as Megan said, this is the second webinar in our spring series on research funding and publication. Uh, we think it'll be useful for faculty as well as uh, the growing number of graduate students at UDC. So please feel free to share that with your graduate students. Uh, my name is Kathy Niels. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the reference and assessment librarian at the UDC library. Okay. Um, so this webinar will cover what peer review is and why it's done, the general arc of the peer review process, the types of peer review, what reviewers are looking for, serving as a peer reviewer, and the tensions within and the criticisms of peer review. Um, and as Megan said, we will have time for questions and discussion at the end. So what is peer review? Um, the concept of peer review is probably familiar to many of us, uh, but to frame our discussion today and ensure that we're all starting on the same page, uh, I do still want to begin here by taking a step back and talking about what it is and why it's done. So what is peer review? Uh, the precise origins and the time frame for those origins of peer review are debated, um, but it's pretty safe to say that peer review as a concept has been around for centuries. Um, the way we know it today is actually a relatively recent creation, though, starting in post-World War II era. Uh, Eve et al. in their book, Reading Peer Review, divine peer review it this way. Uh, peer review is the system by which manuscripts and other scholarly objects are vetted for validity, appraised for originality, and selected for publication as articles in academic journals, as academic books, monographs, and in different forms. So as you can see, this definition is really broad, um, covering different contexts and different scholarly objects. And that's likely because it's an attempt to define something that can be practiced in a variety of contexts um, for a variety of scholarly objects. And that can have um, myriad different particulars in specifications, depending on what discipline, publication, or organization you're talking about. Um, and in fact, an article about the challenges of peer review, um, some of which we'll get to later, uh, Richard Smith, the former editor of the British Medical Journal, wrote in a 2006 article in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine that peer review is impossible to define in operational terms. And he continues, peer review is thus like poetry, love, or justice, um, but it is something to do with a grant application or a paper being scrutinized by a third party. I just really enjoyed how he put that, poetry, love, or justice. <laughs> okay. So why peer review? Um, since peer review can vary so much, we'll focus on the most common features and general models of academic peer review, and today on the journal publication process specifically. So the stated aim of peer review is to determine whether a publication should publish a submission or not. Um, peer review aspires to strengthen the content of a publication and the quality of research and writing in it, and is widely considered to be a means of quality control. Um, you'll often hear terms like gold standard with regard to peer review, or words like quality, integrity, um, or rigor. And peer review is often recognized as an imperfect process, um, but at the same time, it's considered a better option than the alternatives. Um, going back to Richard Smith again, he put it like this. Um, famously, it is compared with democracy, a system full of problems, but the least worse we have. And still, it is considered a very, very, very important part of scholarly work. Um, the 2018 Global Reviewer Survey by Publons found that 98% of researchers consider peer review to be important or extremely important, um, and two-thirds of those respondents said that peer review was extremely important. All right, let's walk through the peer review process itself now. Um, again, the details of the peer review process might vary from publication to publication, from 
editor to editor or discipline to discipline, um, but many follow, the, follow this broad model. So let's follow Dr. Felix Firebird through this process. Um, Dr. Firebird is a scholar who's conducted a research study and written up his results. And he's identified a publication that he would like to submit his manuscript to, the Journal of Avian Studies. So first, Dr. Firebird submits his manuscript to the journal, typically through an online portal. And many online portals allow authors to see the status of their submission as it wends its way through the review process. Uh, then the journal editor of the Journal of Avian Studies does a brief review of Dr. Firebird's submission. Uh, the editor is essentially doing a quick reality check here, um, looking for whether the submission is generally within the journal's scope and whether it meets the journal's submission requirements. And here's the first decision point. Um, if the editor thinks that Dr. Firebird's submission is not appropriate for the journal, they can reject it at this point. If the editor thinks that Dr. Firebird's submission is within the journal's scope and requirements, the editorial team then identifies and selects peer reviewers and sends Dr. Firebird's manuscript to them for a few, uh, full review. And it's, it's worth mentioning here that getting a full complement of qualified researchers can be tough, and it's increasingly taking quite a lot of work from editors to come up with a slate of reviewers. Um, editors have been reporting this concept of reviewer fatigue um, that makes it harder to get scholars to agree to a review or even complete the review. So they've got quite a bit of work there. Um, let's say that Dr. Firebird's submission makes it through this first step, um, and then it's sent to the editorial, uh, sorry, the editorial team sends it to the peer reviewers. Reviewers are given a period of time uh, to review Dr. Firebird's submission, write comments and feedback, um, provide a recommendation uh, that the journal reject it, accept it, or revise it and resubmit for reconsideration. Those reviewers' recommendations and feedback are typically intended to inform what is the editorial team's ultimate decision about the submission. And here we have a second decision point where the editorial team considers the assessments of the peer reviewer as well as their own assessment and makes a decision on Dr. Firebird's submission. So if they reject it, it goes back to Dr. Firebird who can then decide his next steps, um, perhaps submitting the manuscript to another journal for consideration. If they accept it, it goes forward in the journal's publication process, and that will involve administrative processes such as author agreements, formatting, and maybe some more editing. And if they recommend revision and resubmission, uh, the editor sends the reviewer's feedback to Dr. Firebird, who can answer, edit, or rebut with justification um, the reviewer's questions and incorporate their feedback into a revised draft and resubmit. And then his resubmission starts the review process again. So this cycle might happen several times before there's a final decision on Dr. Firebird's submission. Um, and this peer review process is, of course, meant to strengthen what appears in the journal, but it is also a lengthy and time-consuming process that can lead to lag time um, between the completion of the research and the publication of the findings. And the length of the process is one of the aspects of the review process that may vary among different publishers or journals. Some have a very quick turnaround and others might take months and months and months. So different types of peer review. There are many models of peer review and again, different disciplines, publishers and journals will use different ones. Um, and so the specifics may vary. So these will just be a few uh, common models that we'll discuss here today. Each has its pluses and minuses. So the first is single blind or single anonymous. Um, the author does not know the identity of the reviewer. And this model is more common in the sciences. Um, what's good about this model is that since the reviewer is anonymous, uh, they may be inclined to provide you know, some more forthright or candid reviews. Um, and in addition, knowing the identity of the author allows the reviewer to consider the author's reputation and the quality of their previous work. But on the other hand, um, knowing the author's identity could create more opportunities for reviewer bias. Uh, reviewers may be less critical of a prominent person in the field and let work that isn't actually that strong kind of skate through the process, or they may discriminate against some scholars, such as more junior scholars or scholars who have marginalized identities and either criticize or decline good submissions. Then we have double blind or double, double anonymous. The author does not know the identity of the reviewer, and the reviewer does not know the identity of the author. Identifying details in the submission are redacted, if there are any. And this model is more common in the humanities or social sciences. Uh, what's good about this model is that it encourages those forthright or candid reviews. 
Um, and really importantly, it reduces the opportunities for bias. Um, but sometimes that anonymity fails, making the process not actually double blind at all. Um, and this is especially possible in smaller niche fields of study where there just aren't that many people involved in the specific field and scholars are more likely to know each other. And the last one we'll mention here is open review. Um, open review can mean a lot of different things. Um, there doesn't appear to be any consensus on the definition yet. Um, but it often refers to a process where the author and reviewer are aware of each other's identities. Um, or it may involve transparent review, uh, where reviewers feedback on versions of the submission are shared alongside the final published version, um, or a collaborative review among reviewers, um, or the reviewers and the authors together. It does foster cooperation and support, which can be great for newer scholars. Um, sometimes, and reviewers might be more inclined to do more thorough reviews um, since their identities will be known and in some cases even published alongside the article. But however, uh, the openness could re reproduce the existing power imba imbalances in inequities in academia that we all know about. Plus reviewers may also choose not to engage with open review processes um, to avoid the possibility of their names being attached to negative reviews. So what are peer reviewers looking for when they review a submission? Um, oftentimes, a journal will provide a specific list or topic areas for them to cover in their feedback. But in general, reviewers are typically looking at these things. The meaningfulness of the research presented. Does it contribute new ideas, concepts, or findings to the field, or illuminate existing work? Whether the research has been situated properly or thoroughly enough in the existing literature. Is the literature review complete? Is there enough context about how the research fits into the broader field? The soundness of the methodology, uh, was the methodology appropriate for the research that was conducted? Is it described in enough detail? Was the research conducted ethically? The soundness of the analysis, discussion, and interpretation. Were the proper anal analysis tools or approaches used? Uh, do the conclusions make sense? Uh, are they appropriately supported by the evidence? If there are visualizations, are they helpful? Uh, whether there are any errors in analysis or reasoning, and in general, clarity and structure. Um, peer reviewers should not be copy editing or looking at grammar. That comes later in the publication process if a submission is accepted for publication, but rather assessing the organization and flow. So now let's talk about the other side of the review process, serving as a reviewer. Uh, so serving as a reviewer has benefits. Um, it's professional service contributing to advancing scholarship and knowledge. Reviewers can list their reviewing on their CVs or perhaps Publons or ORCID and include it in their tenure and promotion portfolios. And in addition, serving as a reviewer is a way to learn about the newest research in the field. So as a reviewer, you're assessing submissions for the characteristics we just talked about, clarity, soundness of conclusions, et cetera. That's the content of the review. Um, but what about how to approach conducting and submitting the review in the first place? So the first is the ethical issues. So don't commit to reviewing a submission if you have a conflict of interest, don't have adequate expertise in the topic of the submission, or even just don't have the time to do a review justice or in a timely fashion. Um, individual journals may have specific ethical guidelines, and the Committee on Publication Ethics has created a thorough and very useful ethical guidelines for peer review document. Um, Megan, perhaps you can find that in the chat. That's from the uh, Committee on Publication Ethics, Ethical Guidelines for Peer Review Document. Then provide detailed and organized comments. Um, you might organize your comments as bullet points or section by section with a discrete set of comments for the literature review and another for the discussion. And then ensure that comments are constructive and provide suggestions. So instead of saying something like, this doesn't make sense, um, offer specific recommendations on how to clarify the point of confusion. And it also helps to identify and name some of the strengths of the piece you're reviewing. And your own expertise, having had your manuscripts reviewed, can definitely inform your practice as a reviewer. Um, what would you want to hear? Um, how would you want to hear it? Uh, Kathy, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. How does one typically list reviewing on their CV? Can you provide an example of this? 
That's a great one. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple ways to, to do that. One is I, for me, I serve as a reviewer for a journal and I put it under um, a service section as its own kind of subheading. That's just me personally. I don't know that there are like accepted ways to do that. Um, but I do know that there are in increasing movements afoot to, you know, list that on, um, you know, online identifiers like ORCID, um, you know, Publons, uh, which is part of Web of Science, is a platform where um, people can get credit for having done reviews, right? So that's something that you can point to as well. And we'll talk about things like ORCID um, in a couple of weeks. We have a webinar on that. So I, I don't know that there's an accepted way to do it, um, but generally speaking, I think it probably belongs under, you know, professional service. You can list the publication and the length of your review or the uh, time that you have served as a reviewer. Great question. <clears throat> okay, so the tensions in peer review and the criticisms of peer review. Um, so now that we've covered the general process, um, I wanna zoom out a little bit and discuss a few of the tensions and criticisms um, of peer review kind of writ large. Uh, so peer review does have many good intentions and it does have its strengths as a process. Uh, but in order to really understand the full process, it's worth looking at a few of the common critiques and tensions. So the first is the failures and inconsistencies that come up. Peer review is imperfect. Um, it's had many well-publicized failures. Um, errors or unethical research do get published in studies about the peer review process suggest that reviewers do often fail to identify errors in submitted manuscripts. That's one issue. Ethical concerns. Um, the success of the peer review model relies on ethical behavior, uh, good faith, and good intentions, which unfortunately are not always a reality. Um, so from an ethical standpoint, reviewers are not supposed to review outside of their area of expertise, um, but there's no good systematic way to ensure that it doesn't happen. And plus there are concerns around and examples out there of uh, potential peer reviewer fraud and misuse, um, such as providing overly negative reviews as a means to discredit other scholars or taking others' research before it's published and presenting it as one's own. The depth and quality of reviews. Um, some scholars who looked at this issue have expressed major concerns about unevenness in the depth and quality of peer reviews and the potential impact on scholarly research. Uh, many reviewers don't receive training in how to be a peer reviewer. Um, and review, reviews themselves can range from cursory to really meticulous. And journal editors have noted that they sometimes really struggle to reconcile these wildly diverging assessments of a same, the same piece. One reviewer will say, this is amazing, and the other will say, this needs to be rejected out of hand. Bias. Um, critiques of peer review point to many different types of potential bias can, that can weave into the process. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the discussion of peer review models, there may be a bias for senior or prominent scholars or bias against uh, junior scholars, BIPOC scholars, scholars with other marginalized identities and non-Western scholars. Um, there's some evidence as well of bias against negative studies. Um, that's the studies that suggest that an intervention doesn't work or makes no difference. Um, gatekeeping. Peer review is sometimes criticized for serving as a form of gatekeeping that may keep out or make it more difficult for scholars to publish materials with new or inventive or challenging methodologies or findings, ways of knowing, paradigms, um, research that focuses on historically marginalized groups or topics. And related to that is a concern about a uh, lack of diversity among the reviewer pool. Um, increasing the diversity of reviewers is an important goal, um, but at the same time, journals have to be mindful of the well-known uh, tendencies in academia to pile excessive service demands onto the, quote, diverse faculty, which draws time and energy away from their own teaching and research. And the definition of peer. When we're talking about peer review, what do we mean by peer? Uh, what are the characteristics and qualifications of a peer? Um, there isn't a standard, which is understandable to some extent, given the variations across academic areas of study. But at the same time, how are we to understand the meaning of peer review when we don't have a framework to know who constitutes a peer? And the last I'll mention here is time. Um, peer review requires a lot of work from a lot of people, and it can take a long, long time. 
And of course, that's because journals and editors want to be thorough and careful and ensure the integrity of what they publish. But this can also be a disadvantage when there's a pressing need to know more and know it fast, um, as we've seen with medical research on COVID. So to close, let's talk about what could be next for peer review. Um, of course, nobody knows the future for certain, um, but peer review practices have evolved over time and likely will continue to evolve. Um, what happens in the future may be as varied as the way the peer review is practiced right now. But that said, um, here are a few issues that scholars and publishers have identified um, as ones that could either emerge further or that they have identified for their wish lists um, as means to improve peer review. First is more openness in the process, um, such as through open peer review, um, increased transparency, or open science. Um, younger generations of researchers may be more amenable to open approaches in particular. Uh, better incentives for reviewers. This goes back to the question of putting something on your CV too. Um, this would include more recognition of reviewing as an important service that contributes to the profession, um, especially as it relates to tenure and promotion. Um, Providing better incentives could result in higher quality reviews and make more potential reviewers more likely to consider reviewing at all. And then more research on the peer review process itself um, to ex examine the process um, and provide findings to improve understanding of both the positives and the negatives of a peer review and, and apply those findings to make it work better for everyone. And that is it for the formal presentation. We can open things up to um, questions or discussion. Please feel free to either put your questions in the chat or unmute them. Um, while you think of something to ask, I'm gonna put our feedback form in the chat and we would love to hear what you think of this. Um, we do have a question in the chat. It is, if a submission is rejected after a peer review, would it be advisable to revise and resubmit or to try to other journals? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And I think sometimes it, the answer would be it depends a little bit based on what you hear back from peer reviewers, right? If the issue is that, um, you know, an editor perceives that a submission is a little bit out of scope, maybe for the journal, um, then maybe, yeah, just resubmit as is to another journal in the field that might be a, a closer match for uh, the manuscript. But, um, you know, if, if you've gotten comments um, from peer reviewers or an editor, um, yeah, and then maybe consider, you know, adding some stuff, fleshing out some things, making some edits um, before resubmitting. But, you know, it's, I think it's fair to, it's fair to submit to other journals. Um, you know, you shouldn't do that while you are getting a review from a particular journal. But once, um, if you, if the article has been rejected, then it's fair game to apply to others. Anyone else? So Kathy, I was wondering, uh, just related to that, given that you yourself have gone through the peer review process on both sides, do you want to talk about the time you've received revision requests from an editor? Yeah, um, I actually, uh, I found them really, really helpful. Um, I was lucky in that I think, you know, there's this sort of fear that reviewers will be really harsh and there are you know many documented examples of reviewers being um uh, like kind of petty or or sometimes me and there's the infamous you know reviewer number two who kind of goes off um but i found i found the comments to be pretty helpful um you know maybe not as detailed with specific uh specific suggestions um maybe not as much as i would have liked but they were organized in kind of bullet point section by section um and i think you know they in this case, the reviewers mostly agreed on some of the topic areas, and I did make changes and resubmit, and my manuscript was accepted for publication. Um, so that was, you know, eminently helpful. And in another case, you know, not a scholarly article, but a, a chapter that I submitted, um, I got really wonderful comments from um, the editors who, you know, I had already, you know, agreed to, to submit a chapter, and so I was, you know, kind of, um, you know, I had that in the pipeline ready to go, but they provided really thoughtful ideas about um, ways that I could strengthen the piece. So yeah, I've, I've personally had really positive experiences. I know that's not necessarily the case with other folks, 
Um, one thing I am interested in, in doing in the future is, is pursuing the open peer review process. I know there's the, some publications in the library and information sciences field are doing that um, kind of as a means of radical transparency. Um, it just is an interesting way to sort of challenge the, the power structures and the, the assumptions embedded and, you know, what it means to um, provide quality research and to promote research as a discussion and ongoing conversation um, among scholars. So I, I think that's something that I'm looking forward to trying at some point in the future, perhaps maybe with some of the, the research that Megan and I are working on right now, that might be an option. Thanks. Yeah, and I know I'm currently going through um, a book chapter process and we're at the peer review stage. So it's interesting. They're doing it semi-open where they're pairing you up with another book chapter author. So you review their chapter while they review yours. Um, so it is that open. You get to read their piece, comment, and things like that. But they even had some sort of subtle peer review editing included if you wanted to take part in um, providing an outline of your book chapter. And then the editors of the publication, you know, went in and the comments, again, I saw were all incredibly helpful and open. But mm -hmm. um, what's nice about this is in my encounters with peer review, the editors want you to succeed for the most part. And I mean, that might just be the field of library science for generally uh, helpful groups of people, but most peer reviewers aren't looking, you know, to go around to be like, oh, no, this is awful. Um, mm -hmm. They do encounter those pieces, but, you know, I, I have not encountered people who are just set, you know, those, those are the bad eggs. Um, yeah. And so I like to view peer review as a way to make the work better. Um, so yeah, it can be scary that first time though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say I've really, really appreciated. I've served as a reviewer for a publication for a few years now, um, and I've reviewed a handful of, of things. And I have really, really appreciated that process. I think one is the content area of the, the publication is a little bit more of an international perspective. So it's kind of cool to get um, to see research from other areas that you know don't show up in the kind of U.S. focused, U.S. centric um, library and information science journals. Um, but, you know, I, I see the kinds of things that people are, are working on, right, um, you know, get a glimpse into the, the topic areas and, and things like that that might inform our work here in the library at UDC. And it's, I think, helped me be, to, you know, think about how, uh, how, I re, how I review, I think, I've tried to be really mindful and provide, um, you know, thorough comments and constructive comments as well, you know, really trying to imagine myself on the other side of that. Um, and, you know, that takes time, right? I know that's that's one of the challenges with it. It, it will take me a day or two um, to really get into an article, but I think it's been an incredibly value, valuable process for me. Um, so again, we've had positive experiences. I'm sure <laughs> others have not gone as smoothly, um, but for me, it's been, it's been a pleasure. All right, just giving a chance for any more questions. All right, again, thank you for attending today. And just in case anyone wants to ask any questions on recorded, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>